Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you to today's webinar presentation hosted by the IEEE Standards Association. My name is David Stankowitz. I am the event producer for this session and your quote-unquote MC for today's webinar on the topic of IEEE Green ICT Initiative Standards. We are so very lucky to be joined today by Jafar El Mergani. Jafar is from the University of Leeds in the UK. And um, we also have three surprise guests on the line as well, some other subject matter experts, if you will, in this space, who Jafar is going to introduce to us momentarily. Um, next slide, Jafar. And it's uh, <clears throat> just a basic intro slide. I want to let everybody know before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items. and. Um, Below are three different ways that you can uh, participate in today's session. If you join today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system, uh, also known as VoIP or uh, voice uh, over IP, this means you'll be able to hear the presentation in its entirety without dialing in using your telephone. So this is a, uh, a one-way broadcast from myself, Jafar, and the three guest speakers to you. At the end of the presentation, though, we will be taking questions from you, the audience, so you have the ability to ask any of our guests a question using the WebEx chat feature. This is uh, located in the what should be the upper right-hand side of your WebEx interface or window pane. If you simply click that chat button and type your question in to the host, myself, David Stankowitz, and click send, we will get to as many of those questions at the back of the presentation as possible. Um, we're also recording today's webinar, so I want to let you know that the recording feature is on. If you come in late or you have to leave early, um, if for whatever reason anyone who's watching this on demand missed the entire session, you will be able to go back and, and watch it. Uh, we will be sharing out uh, not only the recording of this presentation, but Jafar's PowerPoint slide deck as well. So Jafar, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll go ahead and mute my line, uh, let you take us through the agenda, and if you want to unmute yourself, I will kick it over to you. Um, welcome, everybody, and uh, uh, to this uh, webinar. I'm uh, Jafar al Murgani, as introduced uh, by David. And this is our agenda. Uh, the welcome uh, has already uh, started. Um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, in a short while, introduce myself, but um, uh, uh, I'll also then be going on to uh, present an, an overview of the ITP Green ICT uh, initiative, uh, the standards. And uh, as David mentioned, we have uh, three uh, guest speakers uh, today, and hopefully they will interact with you more during the question and answer session, uh, Thomas, uh, Anna, and Elle. And at the end, we will have a question and answer uh, session uh, uh, just uh, before the end. Okay. Right, so this is just a little bit about uh, my background. i um, a uh, professor in the University of Leeds in the School of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. My research is in communication networks and systems, and uh, I have been uh, co-chair of the Green ICT Initiative now for about uh, uh, four years. Um, I uh, have research uh, in uh, optical systems, but generally also in networks. I've published a number of papers, and uh, I've been with uh, the IEEE and the IEEE Communication Society now for roughly about 25 years. And uh, over this time, I have uh, chaired different uh, uh, committees and participated to the, in the Communication Society in different ways. The initiative, I'll mention a little bit more about it as we uh, uh, get going, uh, but it is a finite to please society's uh, initiative. Okay, so this is uh, uh, an outline of uh, today's webinar. I'll start with an introduction, and hopefully here I'll say a little bit uh, about the ICT carbon footprint and some of the traffic trends, and hence the motivation for establishing those uh, standards. Then I'll talk about the RGP Green ICT initiative itself and what it aims uh, to achieve and uh, its areas of activity. And then the bulk of the presentation is going to be around those three areas, which are the three areas in which we have the standards. The first area is a set of standards for uh, green core and content distribution networks and virtualization. I'll not go through them one by one, but there are five here, and we'll go through them as we go through the presentation. Um, then there is a, a second area, standards for energy efficient 
uh, communication hardware. And uh, this is, uh, as, as can be uh, seen clearly, is more focused on uh, communication hardware. The first one is more on the uh, network and the content distribution. And then the third one is more focused on emissions and estimation of uh, emissions. And uh, each of those two areas have got uh, two standards. So in total, we have got uh, nine standards uh, that have uh, started uh, as a result of working uh, this initiative. So making a start talking about the uh, ICT and its carbon footprint and some of the uh, traffic trends. Um, so the, these are results uh, that uh, um, were shared with us uh, by uh, Jesse, the Global e Sustainability Initiative. And uh, they show, uh, first of all, here the carbon uh, emissions worldwide. So for a long time, the uh, largest amount of emissions used to come from the U.S. Until about uh, just after the year 2000, uh, China overtook that as the largest uh, producer of uh, carbon emissions, and these are quite large. So here is an example of uh, telecom or the telecom industry. In Italy, for example, Telecom Italia uh, produced about 1% of uh, the emissions and used about 1% of the total energy in the country. And uh, in many countries now, the telecom companies are the single largest consumer of energy, so way ahead of manufacturing industry, chain companies, and so on. Uh, these are uh, results as, uh, 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 that were also given to us by Alcatel Lucent, now uh, Nokia, uh, Bell Labs as a result of engagement in uh, Green Touch. Now, looking at how JC broke down, how the Global Sustainability Initiative broke down those uh, emissions or those uh, 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 contributions by the different sectors of ICT, telecom contributes about 25% of the total uh, emissions, data centers about 18%, and the rest is uh, preferred device is about 57%. So these standards are mainly concerned with the telecom and the data centers part. ICT overall has got a carbon footprint that is comparable to the global aviation industry, which is quite huge, about 2% of the uh, total uh, carbon emissions in the world. And this is expected to grow to about 4% by the year 2020. And although it is large, the other thing that we have to remember is that ICT is growing at such a, an incredible rate compared, uh, say, to global aviation, which is uh, probably not growing as much or is almost uh, flat. To understand what is uh, driving this forward, we need to look at the traffic, and this is uh, a set of uh, <coughs> traffic uh, <coughs> Uh, projections uh, produced by uh, Green Touch, and uh, Green Touch is an organization uh, made up of uh, 50 uh, member organizations, so it is an international consortium uh, made up of uh, industry and, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, universities. And uh, roughly just at the turn of the century, traffic was growing roughly at the rate of about 300% per year. And obviously, everybody expected it to grow even further, to grow like that. Instead, obviously, it diminished in this front here. And we had the birth of the bubble just around the year 2000 or just after that. But currently still, <coughs> Uh, traffic in networks is growing at about 30 to 40 percent per year, which is quite significant. So if we look at what that means, uh, at 40 percent uh, traffic uh, growth per year, that means the traffic is going to double every two years. It's going to increase by a factor of 30x in 10 years, by a factor of 1,000x in 20 years. So to put that into perspective, if we were to think of ICT consuming currently about 2% of the world energy, and we were to do nothing, and uh, provided the trends continue, then in 10 years we can expect that number to grow to maybe as high as 60%. Obviously, that is not going to happen. And uh, uh, also, uh, there was this uh, very significant challenge for people to try to reduce the uh, energy uh, use of communication networks and improve the ICT energy efficiency. Uh, uh, especially for networks, by a factor of 1,000. So if we're able to achieve that, then in 20 years, we will be able to consume the same amount of energy as we do today, but to accommodate the 1,000 times increase. <coughs> Excuse me for my voice. Um, the uh, 1,000 times uh, increase in traffic. Now, to understand what we can or should do about uh, growth in traffic, we need to understand the trends and uh, uh, some of the strands of traffic. Uh, <coughs> the smallest by, uh, volume is wireless voice, and this is not growing uh, very large at all. Uh, the fastest growing is wireless data. <coughs> Excuse me. 
the, the fastest growing is wireless data. Uh, the largest uh, by volume is internet video, and the second largest is peer-to-peer. -peer. And this is the total uh, backbone uh, traffic, and this is in North America, uh, uh, traffic in terabit per second versus uh, the time in years. And this is, again, from Bell Labs uh, uh, as part of uh, Green Touch. And therefore, any uh, kind of set of measures that uh, tries to improve energy efficiency has got to address those three areas. And uh, those standards uh, in the core uh, network and in the emissions address the first two, the internet media and peer-to-peer. -peer. And the hardware uh, part is obviously applicable to all uh, three areas. Uh, just uh, a little bit about uh, the Green ICT initiative itself. Uh, IEEE introduces those initiatives uh, continuously to ensure that uh, IEEE remains at the forefront of uh, technology all the time. So uh, within IEEE, there is a Future Directions Committee, FTC, and this committee looks at uh, the things that are happening and projected to happen in the future and therefore starts these initiatives to try to bring together all the activities within IEEE under one umbrella. And uh, we have, as a result, the IEEE Green ICT initiative, which started about three years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, there are other initiatives. So there are initiatives in big data, in uh, small cities, and so on. And uh, the mission of the Green ICT initiative is to bring those uh, metrics or to bring an, an increased awareness of uh, uh, green ICT and to develop a holistic approach approach to sustainability throughout ICT by incorporating green metrics and, and design practices through, uh, throughout the ICT technical domains. Now, um, different work is done in different societies, uh, communication society, computer society, uh, microwave theory and technique society, and other societies. And uh, the goal here is to try to bring them together so that uh, a green ICT and metrics uh, and, uh, derived from green ICT would become uh, the norm uh, when we come and design our systems. So the initiative is funded by IEEE, and uh, it introduces new products and services uh, within IEEE. So Standards is one of them, and today we're talking about some of the standards activities, uh, conferences, publications, and education. So within standards, there have been uh, nine uh, standards proposals uh, uh, approved, and now we have the projects uh, starting, and hopefully running over the next two years uh, to try to define them and find, uh, finalize those uh, standards I mentioned. In publications, there are magazines, a uh, magazine proposal and a uh, transaction, which actually started in January, and obviously courses and, and webinars. Uh, the goal is to try to have metrics throughout the IEEE that uh, relate to uh, hardware design, energy-aware algorithms, and hopefully uh, for proportional computing uh, included in the different areas within IEEE, but also within standards. So I'll start talking about uh, the first area, standards for uh, green core and content distribution networks and uh, virtualization. The first standard is uh, IEEE P1925.1, which is a standard for energy efficient dynamic line, uh, line rate uh, transmission system. The uh, idea here is to develop a standard uh, that specifies an energy efficient rate adaptive transmission system, which can be used to deploy mixed line rates. So this is work, and the first five standards that I'm going to go through uh, uh, is uh, work that has been developed uh, uh, to a large extent within um, uh, the uh, Green Touch Initiative, and uh, this involved a number of companies. Uh, I mentioned already Nokia, we had uh, Huawei, we had AT&T, we had Intel, we had France Telecom, and a number of other uh, companies uh, that contributed to this, and I co-chaired co the uh, Wired Core uh, and Access Network Working Group there, and this is one of the areas that were developed there. So. The motivation for this is that uh, traffic varies uh, during the day and uh, at different points in time, and we have transponders and uh, also routers uh, that work at a given data rate. And therefore, imagine a situation in which the traffic is, say, 110 gigabit per second, and you have got transponders that work at uh, 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit, uh, 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit, and so on. And now, to meet a traffic demand of 110 gigabit, you can end up using, say, two transponders of 100 gigabit and therefore waste a lot. Or maybe you can use uh, one uh, transponder at 100 gigabit and another transponder at 10 gigabit, and therefore try to match the traffic to the transponders you have, and therefore reduce wastage and save power consumption. And this is uh, the, the idea behind this standard, uh, trying to standardize this approach. 
So it introduces the architecture and mechanisms needed to enable the use of an op optimal combination of line rates to accommodate the traffic while reducing power consumption. Uh, obviously, the purpose is to improve energy efficiency, and uh, this is applicable in high uh, capacity core metropolitan and access uh, uh, networks. So here is an example where we have got uh, uh, power consumption of different equipment. So uh, power consumption of a router port uh, at 40 gigabits per second is about one kilowatt. Uh, transponders, uh, 45 watt at 10 gigabit, uh, 73 watts at 40 gigabit, and 135 watt at uh, 100 gigabit. So if we were to imagine an example in which we uh, have got a, a traffic of roughly, say, 110 gigabit, then we can use two of the 100 gigabit transponders, in which case we consume 270 watts, or we can use one of the 10 uh, of the 100 gigabit and one of the 10 gigabit, in which case we meet the demand, but uh, in this case we will consume uh, 135 plus 45 plus 180 watts, which is much less than 270 watts. Therefore, there is an advantage in trying to have granularity in the data rates uh, that you support and to use an optimal combination of these data rates to improve your uh, energy efficiency. This can be taken further uh, if, uh, or if the M is used uh, uh, or sudden frequency division multiplexing and the optical version of this, where we have got the ITU uh, grid, which is uh, 50 gigahertz that can be subdivided into a number of subcarriers. And therefore, we use an optimum number of these subcarriers to meet our demand. Here is an example of an OFDM transponder that has got serial to parallel conversion, modulation, uh, inverse FFT, parallel to serial conversion, digital to analog conversion, an optical transmitter, and then the opposite at the receiver. And this is what it can do. So I'll uh, quote some uh, uh, numbers here just by way of example. If we go for a very low order modulation format, then we do not require very high signal to noise ratio. Therefore, we can transmit for uh, over very long distances, in this case here, yeah, 2,000 kilometers. Obviously, this includes amplification on the way. And this is the uh, power consumption. We can go to higher order modulation formats, in which case, instead of 40 gigabit, we can achieve 120 gigabit but we require high signal-to-noise ratios and therefore our transmission range becomes smaller and we consume more power. And therefore, uh, there is an optimum combination here of line rates that meets your demand. Also, uh, as you change those line rates or you use a, a higher data rate transponder, it doesn't go as far and may consume higher power. And therefore, we need to come up with the optimum combination. Here is an example where uh, versus time of day, we show uh, the power consumption. And as you can see first, at the small hours of the day, 2 a.m., 4 and 6 and 8 a.m., the traffic is low and the power consumption generally in all of the approaches is low. At the uh, uh, later time of the day, the traffic is high and the power consumption is high. Um, we have got here the 10 gigabit uh, uh, transponder, and if we have to use 10 gigabit transponders throughout, then at low traffic they are a good choice, at high traffic they are not such a good choice, and we can see that very clearly from here. For example, if I was to use uh, 10, 10 gigabit transponders, I will consume 450 watts instead of just using one 100 gigabit transponder, which will consume 135 watts. Uh, followed uh, by closely, uh, better is a 100 gigabit transponder. Having granulite is good, so 40 gigabit transponder. And then the red curve here is uh, mixed line rates. And these are two versions, the lowest ones, two versions of OFDM, one that is uh, spectrum mini uh, minimized, so uses spectrum in a very good way, and the second is power minimized. Uh, this here shows a similar kind of set of uh, trends, but what is important here is that we can have uh, some uh, good savings and combinations of uh, uh, data rates uh, that can result in uh, the best uh, outcome if we were to use uh, mixed line rates. So one key question is uh, how large should a, 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 a multi-term transponder power consumption be before it becomes uh, as good or, or not, not better than a mixed line rate? So here it, uh, we have got uh, the worst case, uh, 100 gigabit has got no granularity at all or not as good, uh, 40 gigabit transponder, the 10 gigabit, the mixed line rates. And here is an example of an RTM transponder up to maybe about 400 watts that is good. Uh, as good as uh, mixed line rates. And uh, we can also get a lot of uh, um, saving in spectrum. 
while not uh, sacrificing a lot of uh, um, uh, degradation in power consumption as we saw uh, over here. Uh, the difference between the spectrum minimized and the power minimized is not very large, but if you also were to uh, head for reducing the number of subcarriers needed, you can reduce that a lot or significantly by about 35%. And therefore, this standard is about coming up with the optimum combination of line rates to use uh, to minimize uh, the uh, power consumption for a given amount of uh, traffic, but also trying to look at ways whereby you can uh, reduce the amount of uh, spectrum that you use. I'll move on to the next standard, which is 1926.1, which is a standard for a functional architecture of distributed energy efficient big data processing. So currently we're seeing a huge increase in data and uh, big data has got a number of properties. Uh, volume is one of the important ones. We have got variety, it comes from so many different sources. It has got velocity, it changes very quickly. It has got veracity, it means uh, a requirement for uh, accuracy and uh, validation of the data. Uh, but one key observation in big data is that um, uh, data is not knowledge and generally people are interested in the knowledge that is included in the data. And Therefore, there is a potential to try to reduce the volume of the data by just extracting the knowledge that is in embedded in that data and transmitting the knowledge instead of transmitting the data. And therefore, there is a question of uh, where do you process to extract uh, knowledge from data, how much do you process, and how do you optimize this overall approach in a way that is interoperable. And this is the topic of this standard. So the standard specifies a functional architecture that supports the energy efficient transmission and processing of large volumes of data, starting at the processing nodes close to the data source. So as far as possible, if you can process near the edge of the network and reduce the volume right from the start, you then can end up with significant uh, uh, savings in terms of uh, power consumption. And then we can provide more processing resources in the centralized data centers. Uh, the purpose is obviously to improve energy efficiency of uh, these big data networks, and uh, the standard is needed so that uh, these efforts can be uh, coordinated uh, all the way inside the data center at the edge and throughout uh, the network. I'll just try to explain the uh, principle here using uh, two diagrams. So this is um, one example of a core network uh, with a number of nodes, and here at the edge we have got different uh, set of measurements. NHS is the National Health Service, which is like uh, uh, in the UK the uh, uh, government uh, entity looking at uh, different hospitals and so on. Uh, maybe financial data, social uh, networks data, and uh, maybe business data. Currently, all this data is taken in the network and is transmitted in a way that uh, uh, where we transmit uh, all the information as big chunks and we send it to central data centers for processing. Now, these big chunks going uh, down the network will consume a, a lot of uh, energy and that is not needed because they actually uh, represent data and not knowledge and we're interested in the knowledge and not the data most of the time. So here is an example of uh, distributed uh, processing in big data, which is uh, the uh, goal behind this uh, standard. We have got the entities that produce uh, the data, and this may be in large chunks. Uh, now, these chunks have uh, had the opportunity to be processed in a, a small processing node here at the edge of the network. And that resulted in one of the chunks being converted into info, which is uh, uh, knowledge, not data. But this node was not large enough to actually process the uh, other two chunks. So these other two chunks continue as chunks, and they come to this node here, where now here we have got enough processing capability to turn those two chunks into uh, two further uh, info. And therefore, the info now uh, proceeds all the way to the central data center. So we have reduced a little bit the traffic on this link, but we have reduced the traffic substantially on this link here. In this example, uh, the uh, traffic has been reduced all the way from the source into info uh, all the way along, and therefore we get a significant amount of saving. Obviously, uh, there are entities that own the data, there are, there are data centers for uh, processing, and, and the network operators may also own uh, some of these uh, uh, nodes, and therefore, there is a need for coordination in terms of how this uh, uh, process is done uh, to uh, uh, process the data, but also to reduce power consumption in the network. 
and move on to 1927.1. And this is a standard for services provided by the energy efficient orchestration and management of virtualized distributed data centers interconnected by a virtualized network. What this standard is about is, is about uh, providing uh, computational resources and also networks that interconnect them in a, an energy efficient way and also being able to share those computational resources and networks between a number of operators. So uh, uh, the, the general uh, uh, principle is that you will have um, a network that may be owned by a large operator and then slices of these uh, network may be provided to uh, secondary operators or people who uh, do not own the uh, full infrastructure but also want part of that infrastructure to interconnect their entities and in addition uh, those uh, secondary operators may be interested not only in network resources but also in computational resources so therefore parts of the data centers may be sliced and provided to those uh, uh, secondary operators so that they have computational resources and network resources that they do not necessarily own as physical entities but uh, have full access to and uh, uh, these are protected in a virtual uh, kind of uh, uh, setting. So the standard specifies an architecture for a service composed of distributed data centers interconnected by a network and it specifies the interfaces and the dynamic orchestration and management mechanisms for this energy efficient allocation of resources from data centers and network. Uh, the purpose is obviously to uh, provide energy efficient uh, networking in this case, but also to enable this uh, concept uh, in the first place. Uh, and the need is to reduce the uh, energy consumption of virtualized interconnected data centers. I'll try to show this here through an example. So here is a network, and these are uh, three enterprises that request these different uh, network topologies, or maybe three virtual network operators that request these different uh, virtual network uh, topologies. Uh, each line here is uh, a link that represents communication, and each node here is uh, a set of uh, servers or processing capability that this uh, operator requires. So um, here is an example of how we try to meet that demand. We placed one node here, one node uh, at this uh, second node in the network, and the third here, and then we interconnect them. So the process of taking the virtual request into the physical network, we call that embedding. Uh, and then here is another example, and these have been embedded here, and this is the third example, and they have been embedded in this way. And as you can see from this example, example, there will be uh, several ways in which you can meet those requirements and therefore uh, there is a need to uh, find the optimal way of doing this in a way that uh, minimizes uh, power consumption and this standard specifies uh, the algorithms needed to minimize power consumption in this setting. So here is uh, uh, how it can be set up in uh, an optical network, uh, a physical layer and an IP layer uh, running on top of that. And here are requests where, for example, we had the green request, somebody requesting a network of this topology. It has been embedded in these three nodes and interconnected. And the uh, blue requested this kind of topology and it has been embedded here, here, and here, and they have been interconnected. And the yellow said, uh, well, they are happy even if all their nodes are embedded in the same node, so they are embedded in here. And uh, the orchestration and management of this is what this standard is about. P1928.1 is a standard for a mechanism for energy efficient virtual machine placement. Um, so the purpose here is um, now currently we do obviously a lot of the computational uh, tasks that we have in virtual machines. And these virtual machines can be placed in different uh, regions uh, in our network. Now imagine a scenario in which we have a network that covers, say, uh, continental US. And uh, we have got a number of users in the East Coast, and these users in the East Coast request uh, a virtual machine. And the virtual machine happens to be in a data center running in the West Coast. And therefore, we're going across the network from East Coast to West Coast to uh, try to uh, uh, provide that virtual machine to the users who are located in the East Coast. What would be more efficient is to migrate that virtual machine closer to the users in the East Coast so that they do their processing uh, locally if possible. Now, what happens then if we have got uh, users in the East Coast and users also in the West Coast interested in this virtual machine? Where do we place it? 
Uh, what we what may be a good idea here is to replicate it. So make one copy in the East Coast and one copy in the West Coast. And uh, then replication can be in two flavors. If you make a copy, it uses as much energy as the original copy, or and we call that simply replication, or it may be in a way that uh, if uh, half the users use it, then it uses half the energy, and we call that slicing. And therefore, this uh, standard here is a standard for a mechanism for energy-efficient virtual machine placement, where you place virtual machines in your network in a way that minimizes power consumption. So this standard specifies an algorithm for energy-efficient virtual machine placement uh, set of strategies, considering network and computational power consumption. It also considers the geographic distribution of user demand, as I have just uh, given in the, in the example. So the purpose of this standard is uh, to enable energy efficient processing of information and we have got data centers that are distributed across uh, uh, a range of uh, geographic areas. So here is an example of a uh, network and this is a network that uh, covers uh, continental US with uh, 14 nodes. We have got a number of users who uh, are interested in a number of virtual machines. And the question is, where do we place those virtual machines? In other words, where do we uh, have them placed? Where should we have uh, clouds in this network? So the number of clouds and the location of clouds. And once we have done that, uh, which virtual machine should be placed in which cloud? And then subsequently, we need to build those uh, uh, capabilities within those clouds, and therefore the number of servers, the number of switches, and the number of routers, which may already be uh, embedded in these clouds, but we are just switching them on or bringing them online. And then finally, we need to find the best routes uh, to take the information from the virtual machines to the users in a way that minimizes power consumption. And therefore, we uh, and these are the kind of uh, savings in power consumption that we get through those approaches, the slicing, uh, which is an approach in which you can make copies of the virtual machine where each copy uh, consumes a, a, a certain amount of power that is proportional to the number of users uh, that are, are using it. Currently, we do not have that, at least not implemented uh, widely, and therefore, in a later standard that I'm going to talk about, you, you will see uh, uh, ways in which we can introduce power proportional computing. If we do not have power proportional computing, then we can either migrate or replicate. But if we can uh, do slice, we can achieve a lot more uh, energy efficiency. Um, I have already mentioned uh, the migration, the replication, and the slicing. Migrating me meaning means move the virtual machine closer to where the users who are using it are. Replicating means make a copy and next to each cluster or group of users. Slicing means make a copy next to each group of users, but each slice uses a smaller amount of power proportional to the number of users. And uh, there is a heuristic or an algorithm for doing this. And as you can see here, these are node IDs of the network and these are the uh, number of virtual machines placed. Uh, under slicing, you make a copy almost everywhere. Under replication and migration, you make copies in very popular nodes. And here, node 6 is a very good node. It's uh, equidistant or, or has got the minimum average hop distance to every other node in the network, and therefore is a good uh, placement. I'll move on to talk about, uh, uh, about uh, 1929.1, which is an architecture framework for energy efficient content distribution. So in a similar way that we have to place virtual machines in an optimum way, also content has got to be placed in, in a good uh, position. Currently about 90% uh, um, of, uh, uh, of the uh, traffic uh, about 90% of uh, the traffic on uh, the network uh, is uh, a form of video. And uh, therefore, if we're able to reduce uh, the power consumption associated with uh, video uh, distribution, then we can reduce the power consumption uh, quite significantly of uh, networks. And uh, we can do this uh, through content caching or making copies of the uh, content closer to users. and. Um, uh, and although this has been kind of examined for reducing latency, it has not been examined for, uh, at least uh, not standardized, for reducing uh, power consumption. And the, the purpose of this standard is to um, enable this uh, for uh, reduction in power consumption uh, when we consider content distribution. So again, here is a network with a number of users who are interested in content. The question is, where should we place this content? And uh, uh, then uh, how many clouds should we 
we have or where should it be should they be placed and how to route the uh, content optimally from the from these clouds to the users in a way that minimizes power consumption now the obvious question may come to your mind if you're making copies of content everywhere are you not increasing actually power consumption and it turns out that we can actually reduce power consumption the main reason for that is that content popularity usually has got a distribution like this uh, uh, which is a heavy uh, tail distribution. If you look at the likes of YouTube, for example, while it may have a few hundred million maybe videos, uh, only maybe 50 or 100 videos are the most popular ones. And they account for maybe 70 or 80 percent of the hits uh, on, on the server. And therefore, you do not need to make a copy of everything. You only need to make copy of this most popular uh, content and uh, replicate them in uh, the different locations in the network. And by doing this, you will have, uh, yes, increased uh, the power consumption of uh, some of the uh, uh, nodes, but uh, you have significantly reduced the journeys up and down the network to get the content, say, from a centralized uh, node. Uh, doing this, uh, the sort of uh, power consumption savings, uh, the maximum uh, that we can get uh, in this example here is about 70%. And uh, the, these diagrams here show how we are replicating content. Um, so uh, I'll not uh, go through a lot through that, but a uh, dark dot means that content is being replicated. Here we have popularity groups, 50 popularity groups. And uh, along here we have got the network uh, nodes, uh, which are uh, 14 nodes. And uh, at uh, 6 a.m., for example, uh, there isn't a lot of traffic and therefore we are only putting or we're putting all the content in a central node, which is node 6 in this case. At 10 uh, at p.m., the traffic is maximum. Uh, the most unpopular content is still left in the central server. The more popular content is replicated everywhere. And therefore, the decision to replicate is dictated by two things. One, the popularity of the content. If content is not popular, you're always going to place it uh, or leave it in the central server. Second, by the amount of traffic that you have in the network. If everybody's sleeping, there is no point, or if everybody's not accessing content, there is no point in uh, replicating content. Only when the traffic is high, replicate the content. And uh, the uh, standard tries to uh, uh, organize uh, uh, the way that content should be handled in a way that is energy efficient. I'll just mention one or two things about uh, Green Touch, which uh, worked between 2010 and 2015. Um, to reduce the power consumption by a factor of 1,000. Uh, the core network and the content distribution network had a goal of roughly uh, about uh, 300. And uh, here is an example, or another example of a continental US uh, network. Um, and uh, the, the power consumption in the end was reduced by a factor of uh, 1,000. And this was done, and the methods needed to achieve this were shown uh, last year, uh, sorry, year before, uh, end of uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are projections of, uh, of uh, traffic using the methods and power consumption using the methods introduced by printers. Currently, networks do not adapt. They, they just they consume the same amount of uh, power, whether uh, the equipment is handling a lot of traffic or little traffic. Here with Green Touch, it adapts with the uh, kind of uh, traffic that we have. And in the end, uh, the energy efficiency is improved by a factor of 316x. This is for the core network. Overall, uh, it is uh, 1,000x. What this was made up of is uh, some business as usual, more slow improvement. Some improvements in hardware, interconnects and optimized packet processing, link optimized signal processing in transponders. Uh, protection resources that were usually left on all the time, so here are standoff. Um, uh, router bypass and uh, sleep modes. Um, uh, dynamic uh, allocation of line rates, uh, optimizing the network topology and optimizing the cloud and, and virtualization. And this gave the overall factor, but also, as you can see here, uh, the standards uh, address a number of these areas, for example, the content distribution, uh, the mixed uh, line rates, and because we're doing the routing, therefore, some of these uh, sleep modes and so on, and some of the uh, link optimization methods. But in addition, introduce other, a number of other areas for other standards that are not directly uh, related to the work that was done uh, in GreenTouch. 
So I'll start talking now about the standards for energy uh, efficient uh, uh, communication uh, hardware. So this standard B1923.1 is a standard for uh, computation of energy uh, efficient upper bound for up operators, operators uh, processing uh, communication signal waveforms. Uh, what this means is that um, generally there are a number of different modulation and coding techniques, different signal waveforms that we can use uh, with our different communication systems, and these result in different energy efficiencies. And the standard is about uh, identifying a way uh, to measure the energy efficiency of different uh, signal waveforms given uh, certain uh, types of uh, power amplifiers that may be used. And uh, while the first set of uh, uh, kind of standards I, I talked about were more relevant to communication society, computer society, and so on, this is a contribution that was made to the Green ICT Initiative by the Microfuel and Techniques Society. Uh, now, um, uh, the, the method uh, enables us to evaluate the energy efficiency of these uh, different uh, waveforms. Uh, also, it allows us to design or to look at the optimum or the best kind of waveforms to use to uh, establish the best energy efficiency if the hardware is fixed. So you can look at it both ways. Uh, the waveform uh, is already pre-selected. What kind of energy efficiency will it give? Or the hardware is known, and we can look at, uh, at the best kind of uh, signal uh, uh, waveform that we can use to provide or to produce the best energy efficiency. And obviously, this is relevant to different wired and wireless uh, communication suppliers and uh, operators. Okay, so uh, this uh, diagram here shows the best uh, efficiency that we get for uh, power amplifiers. And these here are uh, different modulation techniques. And as we go here to the right, uh, this is actually also time progressing. So these are the more recent kind of uh, approaches. So linear power amplifier efficiency is dropping, as you can see uh, in here, with newer standardized signals. Uh, signal modulation selection uh, places this efficiency ceiling on the transmitter design, and therefore we need to be able to predict this uh, power amplifier efficiency uh, ceiling. Uh, first of the time we do the standardization um, before the signal design, and also using a uniform and consistent uh, methodology. And what this this is uh, <coughs> this is what the standard uh, tries to achieve, as I have uh, mentioned. So here is a um, uh, little bit more detail. If you look at uh, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, power consumption or the power that uh, comes from uh, um, uh, the source, there is a certain DC amount of power that is drawn. Uh, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, input power uh, uh, that is input to the amplifier, and uh, this is the input signal power. And then the good power is the power that is uh, produced at the output as radiated, uh, for example, RF power. The rest of the power here is uh, dissipated. And therefore, the goal is to try to minimize this uh, power dissipation and to maximize this um, uh, a signal power that is radiated as useful power. This is the power supply and this is the heat sink uh, size. Uh, so the lower efficiency is usually driven by uh, signal modulation. So for example, if we have a, a large number of uh, zero crossings, that can lead to lower uh, efficiency. Uh, uh, a large heat sink can end up uh, uh, absorb, be, being required to absorb uh, the dissipated power. And uh, we may also need uh, a large amount of uh, supply for a given output uh, RF power that we need. Uh, the goal is to be above 45% uh, efficiency, and generally above 70% it is uh, diminishing returns. And therefore, the standard is about finding uh, the optimum way to uh, design or select uh, signal waveforms for a given uh, circuit design, uh, but uh, also to be able to assess uh, if that design is fixed, what can we achieve uh, with a given signal waveform. I'll move on to talk about uh, uh, E1924.1, which is a recommended practice for developing energy efficient uh, power proportional digital architecture. I mentioned earlier on that uh, uh, virtual machines and computers and, and so on currently consume uh, a large amount of power even when they are idle, when they are not doing any work. And uh, the goal of this uh, standard is to find or to identify a set of guidelines for designers and developers of digital architectures that ensure that power is only consumed when useful computational work is done. And uh, the uh, uh, 
the, the need for this is obviously to uh, reduce the power consumption of devices when they are in idle mode and also to uh, only uh, consume power when we are in the on state uh, doing useful work and therefore uh, we need to go to an on uh, but also we need to be operating at logic uh, switching uh, speeds. This is uh, very important for digital hardware designers, uh, for system architects and, and chip manufacturers. Now, in uh, digital uh, hardware, uh, there is no uh, output power here because uh, everything is uh, just about processing, so um, uh, bits in and bits out. And therefore, by definition, the energy efficiency of any digital processor is inherently uh, zero since we are not uh, producing any output power. And therefore, the goal is to actually minimize this uh, power dissipation here. And if we look at this in a, a kind of a, an example, this is a computing activity and this is the power consumption. The current hardware we have consumes power even when there is no computing activity being carried out and then uh, has got different slopes. Some of them are very flat. This is not very flat, but uh, some hardware has got almost flat power consumption versus computing activity. Ideally, we want to get to this kind of uh, shape here and uh, uh, in which case uh, we consume zero power when there is uh, zero computing and then we have got uh, more uh, uh, power consumption as the computing activity increases. And this is the amount of uh, power that is saved. So um, we obviously must not impact the processing uh, throughput. Uh, we should uh, uh, also make sure that energy uh, draw, uh, drops with activity or with the duty cycle. Ideally, we should go to zero with no activity like we're showing here. And there are a number of methods that are uh, used in this uh, recommendation. Uh, lower input uh, energy and uh, um, uh, um, lower cooling uh, uh, requirements. And the applications are in many areas, in energy harvesting applications, in battery uh, power applications, and in data center uh, applications. Okay, so the last set of uh, standards are standards for ICT emission estimation. So the first of these is P1922.1, which is a standard for a method for calculating anticipated emissions caused by virtual machine migration and placement. So the idea here is that suppose you uh, were to think about some of the examples I gave uh, earlier on, where virtual machines were moved to different locations. Now what we can do also is we can move virtual machines to locations where we know that the energy is, is clean energy and therefore we migrate it to where energy is uh, generated say from uh, renewable energy or, or hydro energy or some form like that. And therefore um, the standard uh, is a method for cal calculating the anticipated emissions that may be caused by virtual machine migration and placement. So the purpose is to assess the anticipated emissions caused by this virtual machine migration and we are interested more or the standard is more interested in marginal emissions. Now what we mean by marginal emissions is that a certain region may be known already to have clean energy, say uh, in Ontario, uh, say in Canada, Ontario for example. Another region may be known to have generally uh, emissions, high emissions, means the energy comes say from oil or something like that, like um, in Canada for example, uh, Alberta. But that cannot be used all the time to mean that it is good to place virtual machines in Ontario and not in Alberta. What matters is at the point when we're placing the virtual machine, what does the uh, energy supply mix look like? Uh, or the extra power that we use, is it coming uh, from uh, a clean energy source or not? And uh, therefore, we need to be able to uh, uh, measure that uh, extra emission uh, to make correct decisions about uh, the placement of uh, virtual machines. So here is an example where uh, data centers can be placed in or are in different locations in the country and we can place the virtual machines in any of those and we are interested in minimizing the marginal greenhouse gas emissions, the extra emissions as a result of placing the uh, virtual machine in a given location. And we have here an Ontario example and maybe an uh, Alberta example, which will become clearer here. So here we have the time of day uh, versus the amount of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And um, uh, in general, uh, Ontario is uh, the red curve here is lower, uh, so greener 
uh, in terms of emissions. And Alberta is uh, not as uh, green. It comes from oil, uh, a lot of it. Um, now, if uh, we were to look at a given point in time, then the decision may be reversed. So, for example, at this point in time here, as it happens, uh, uh, Ontario is producing or the amount of emissions there are higher than uh, Alberta simply because of the kind of uh, energy mix uh, that is being used at that point in time. And therefore, it may be better uh, not to migrate machines from Alberta to Ontario at this point in time. Now, here is the uh, emissions uh, between 2011 and 2013, uh, by way of example. Uh, this is for, for uh, just servers play, uh, placed in Alberta, uh, the blue uh, servers uh, placed in Ontario. And uh, obviously, Alberta is much higher than Ontario. But um, if we were able to migrate and place them optimally, then we get this uh, green curve here. And that means we can save as, high, as much as 44% emission compared to just placing things in Alberta all the time, 9% of the emissions compared to if we were to place them uh, in Ontario. Okay, uh, P1922.2 is a standard for a method to calculate uh, near uh, real-time emissions of information and communication technology. So the, the previous uh, one was about uh, the marginal emissions and uh, where to place the virtual machines. Now here we are interested in the the, the key word here is real time or near real time. That means uh, uh, currently uh, a lot of the emissions are estimated based on the average fuel mix or the average emission in, in, in a, a country or a region. Uh, we want uh, this standard here looks at uh, introducing real time capability to make uh, uh, the correct decision at a given point in time, not using just the history of the previous year and what happened uh, over that time. Uh, so the purpose of this standard is to enable uh, uh, near real-time assessment of ICT infrastructure uh, use space uh, emissions by taking into account the temporal variations of emissions relating to electricity generation. So um, here, here is a, an example of uh, the uh, power uh, mix that is used uh, um, in a, a given region here, in this case, uh, Ontario. So a large amount is uh, produced. So this is time of day, and this is the amount of power in megawatt. A large part comes uh, from nuclear. Then we have got uh, wind and other are quite small here, so not very clear. Uh, hydro is this uh, part here, the natural gas, and the coal is this uh, section. And the dotted curve here is the emissions, uh, which are read on the right-hand axis. And uh, uh, generally, people have used in the past uh, a straight line like this, uh, almost an average uh, amount of emission for the region, uh, whereas the real-time emission may look like this red curve here that goes up and down, and therefore, there can be quite a range of errors uh, if we were to just use the average value at any given point uh, in time. So here is uh, the power consumption uh, required by uh, ICT in, in this region, say uh, Ontario. And here is the historic kind of mix, so nuclear 59%, coal 2%, etc. And if we were to use this to estimate the emission uh, of uh, 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 the ICT in this region, it would be uh, 241 tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per year. If we were to use the actual real-time measurements, then we end up with a 265 tons uh, CO2 equivalent per year, which means that just using the average values, we underestimated our emissions by uh, a factor of about 10%. And therefore, this standard is about standardizing and also bringing real-time capability to the uh, measurement of the emissions. Okay, so I have talked about the nine standards that uh, we ha that have been introduced. And just uh, briefly, two points before we start uh, taking questions. Uh, next steps. Um, so this is a call for participation, and uh, the call has been issued for a number of these standards already, and others will be will have a call issued during March uh, of this year. The expected uh, uh, date of submission of uh, uh, drafts of these uh, proposals to IGPSA for initial uh, sponsor ballot is between July and September 2018. And uh, we expect the project's completion um, uh, sometime uh, August to September 2019. The range in dates is because for different standards, uh, there is uh, just uh, different dates uh, specified. So please join and uh, participate.
And uh, also we try to include uh, a range of uh, references for people who are interested in uh, knowing a bit more. So I'll stop here and uh, I will um, uh, open the uh, uh, floor for uh, discussion and questions. Okay. Um, Hi, Jafar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Sorry, this is, yeah, this is David. I, I did get a, um, a couple of questions here. I think they're more geared towards you than our guest speaker, so if it's okay with you, I'll just, I'll read them aloud in the order in which we receive them. Okay. Um, first question came through from Atul Tambi. Uh, excuse me if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name. Question asks, I believe that mega data centers from companies like Google and Facebook may be consuming a lot of power and may have been doing so um, some time to go more green. What is the IEEE doing to get those companies involved and get their practices more widespread, you know, if anything? Can you answer that? Yes, uh, I, I think I got the gist of the question. Um, uh, th these companies obviously have got uh, huge data centers and they consume a lot of uh, power. They have also been good in that um, they um, have uh, uh, improved the, their PUE, the uh, power usage uh, effectiveness, which is the kind of total the ratio of the total power that is uh, taken from the supply as uh, uh, compared to the power that is used by uh, the ICT equipment within the data center. Uh, at one point, uh, PUE numbers were as high as 1.5, means you take 1.5 times the actual power that you need to operate your service and communication. Now numbers are getting down to 1.1 or, or, or maybe less than that. Uh, and therefore, credit to these uh, companies. Um, IEEE is, uh, is uh, getting involved or is uh, um, working with a number of these. Uh, some of them contributed already to Green Touch and hence uh, uh, are now contributing to the uh, initiative, but also hopefully through these uh, standards we will have involvement more with the companies that are interested. And as you can see, a number of these standards are geared towards uh, uh, reducing uh, the power consumption uh, uh, by looking at optimum ways in which things can be done in these data centers, but also in the network. So uh, please, uh, if, if there are uh, activities and interests, please uh, get in touch with us. Okay, thanks, Jafar. Uh, we had a another question come through. This uh, this one comes through from Sandy Rodder. Sandy, thank you for your question. Jafar, are you including tragedy of the commons, electromagnetic compatibility, spectrum sustainability metrics? Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the focus here mainly is on energy efficiency. Um, now, um, I'm not so sure I, I follow the, the, the question in total, but um, uh, at, at different points we included other metrics in addition to energy efficiency uh, when uh, trying to optimize uh, the network. So we included spectrum, for example, uh, spectrum efficiency as uh, one of our uh, kind of uh, metrics. We included uh, coverage, uh, especially for wireless, uh, as uh, another part of uh, the metrics. Um, electromagnetic contamination, although it was, is not part of uh, the standard here directly, but also in, in form of interference and so on, uh, there have been studies uh, looking at minimizing those. Although the standards here focus more on just uh, energy efficiency. I don't know if uh, Earl is online or would like to say a little bit more. Okay. Um, yeah, the the analysis so far, as Jafar said, has been looking at the uh, power consumption of the thing. Uh, we have not yet looked at uh, electromagnetics, though that's something that I would be very happy to get into, being uh, one of the hardware people here and uh, uh, a representative of MTT. So, well familiar with that, but that, no, that's not part of the discussion yet that I'm aware of. Thanks, uh, thanks, Al. And uh, maybe it is a point for us to connect with the uh, 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 with the question and uh, engage with with people interested in this more. Okay, Jafar. Um, we have another question that came through from uh, Victor D. Pasquale. Victor, thanks for your question. You describe logical network topologies. 
in the standardization process, what depth of commitment to physical networking technology is being made? Can standardization research proceed at a purely logical level? Hmm. Um, it's a very good question. Um, there, there, there has been quite a, a, a detailed involvement with the hardware because ultimately, as, uh, as we know, power is uh, dissipated in the uh, real hardware. And therefore, um, uh, a lot of the work in, in terms of, uh, so the two examples of the hardware that I, uh, I gave earlier on, in terms of uh, um, signal waveforms and uh, also in terms of uh, power proportional computing, look at the specifics of the hardware and improving energy efficiency there. The standard that I mentioned on mixed line rates and so on looks at the details of the hardware and trying to improve uh, things there. I did not mention more specific specific ones uh, relating to, for example, routers uh, processing speeding and slowing down the uh, processing speed within the router according to uh, the uh, uh, type of packets or size of packets that are uh, um, being processed. So uh, when you have very short packets, uh, then the header is a large part of it and you need to work a, a lot faster. So this kind of adaptive rate uh, in terms of processing, so working on, with the hardware at that level. And then also the uh, improving the DSP in transponders. So these are areas that uh, will feed into uh, elements within those standards. So they're not in, uh, totally at the logical level. I went through that uh, slide a little bit uh, uh, quickly. Uh, but maybe uh, we can just uh, show quickly uh, the slide that I meant uh, with some of the green touch. Um, this also, uh, there are these elements on signal processing and transponders, uh, the optimized uh, packet processing, uh, the interconnects, and the interconnects were in the uh, transponder, and uh, the allocation of the uh, line rates, and obviously two standards uh, relating uh, directly to hardware. Uh, uh, this uh, 1923.1 and 1924.1. So I, I, I hope that um, it gives you an idea of some of the hardware elements that uh, uh, if there is also interest in emphasizing some of these more uh, engagement with us in these standards would be great. Okay, Jafar, we, uh, we are near the end of the presentation. I did get one more question, so we'll, we'll take this last one from, uh, from Mark Schaefer. Thanks, Mark, for your question. And um, I think it speaks sort of to your last point, Shafar, about calls for participation. Who has signed up so far for these working groups for these standards? And then two-part question, what is the uh, timeline for producing the standard? Okay. So we have had a, a number of uh, people from different societies, from the communication society, from um, micro theory and techniques, uh, from uh, computer society and uh, the Clear Technology Society, so uh, different participants. Uh, the Green ICT Initiative has got a very large uh, membership, but uh, the, the ones that have signed are from these uh, societies, and they are into the uh, lower kind of uh, tense uh, order. Uh, but obviously this is a call uh, for more people to uh, get uh, involved and, and, and engaged. Um, in terms of the timeline, uh, for some of them, I mentioned uh, a call has already been issued, and usually after the call, we allow about one month to hold our first meeting. So there will be meetings uh, starting to uh, be scheduled from March and April and, and so on. The timeline, I mentioned that briefly. So uh, uh, sep uh, July to September 2018, we're supposed to have a kind of a draft. And then uh, there is uh, roughly about one year after that for the uh, final approval and uh, ballot. And I think uh, there is a slide here with a timeline, uh, which hopefully we will show this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jafar, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we are a little bit over, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Jafar, for your guest uh, appearance today and your presentation. We are going to, again, um, share out the recording from today's presentation. The IEEE Standards Association will let everybody know who participated today, where to find that. Um, and with that, I will end today's session. Thanks for joining everybody, and have a great day.